we've already met. Uh, Claire, uh, Claire Craig, you're a, a diagnostic pathologist. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure in my own mind what a diagnostic pathologist even does, but uh, perhaps you could fold that into uh, an answer about how you react to the to the data, such as it has been released so far by Pfizer. Um, so pathologists are the people in the lab that that make diagnoses for people. If you if you've got a sample sent to a laboratory, we're the ones that look at it. Um, and so we're all about testing and diagnosis, mainly cancer in my case, but it's the whole thing. And, yeah, I have been looking at the data that's come out. So this is data that Pfizer went to court and said they didn't want released for 75 years, which should clearly set alarm bells ringing from the outset. And it was data they'd given to the FDA, so it's the FDA releasing it. It's really difficult to go through it. You know, there's a lot of pages and it's really dense. It's all in PDF format, so you can't just search very easily. But there are sort of a few things about it that are a bit odd. One of them being that they've released um, the sort of medical records in the trial for 36 of the patients. And they had 30 pages each, these patients. And as you go through the pages, you sort of have one page around, you know, just their kind of details and the date of birth and a page on their consent and a page on who enrolled them into the trial. So you can page after page, it's not telling you anything. You have about 15 pages before you get an injection. And then if there's, you know, as things go on, the pages gather. So there's mm. 30 pages per patient there. Mm -hmm. So if it was just the patient's records, you'd expect 1.5 million pages for 44,000 people in a trial. And they've been asked to release 450,000 pages. So there's already a question there about where the pages of the patients are, because that's only a fraction of what's being released. There's a lot of other documentation that comes along in a trial. And um, I think, realistically, it's going to take time to go through all of this. What you've seen, though, so far, is there, is there anything in it that, that makes... You know, you've said the fact that Pfizer wanted to keep it away from the public eye, I've, you know, made alarm bells ring, but is there anything in what is available and what you have seen that, that, that furthers your, your sense of unease? There are a few things, but obviously they're going to release the worst stuff last, aren't they? I mean, they, you know, they're clearly the things that they're going to release first are things that are already in the public domain, things that, you know, are least painful for them. And so um, they're going to release over the course of eight months, so we'll be having this up until August. Um, there was one document they released, which actually was already in the public domain as well, which was the reports of harms in up to the end of February from everybody around the world that had been sent into Pfizer. And a lot of people have got very, very excited about that data. But actually, the numbers were lower than the numbers reported to countrywide reporting systems. So people weren't telling Pfizer, they were telling their own mm. system. And the thing is about these systems, these reporting systems, they're designed to alert you to a particular problem. They're not designed to measure the problem. If you want to measure the problem, you have to look at the whole population and say, well, this is what we'd expect in a normal year for this condition. Has that number gone up or down? And there are studies that have started to come out like that for a few specific diagnoses, and some, some of them are quite worrying. Um, but, but there's a lot more work to do on that to get a feel for how big a problem each of these conditions has been. And we're still at a stage where the government are talking about the rates in the reporting system as if that's all the cases that existed of that condition, which is, is naive in the extreme. And we know from history, because we've had these reporting systems for many years, that there's always underreporting. There's always underreporting, and it's a different rate for different conditions. For some conditions that are very characteristic, doctors say, yep, I recognise that as being a vaccine problem, they're more likely to report them. For things that are much more common, the doctors might be much more likely to dismiss it as coincidental and it might not get reported. Likewise, if you're older, there are far fewer reports because people assume that things go wrong. Tony, what do you think? You've had a, you've had a, a, a look at that data which has been released and is available at the moment. Do, do you share a sense of, I don't know, a dissatisfaction with the way it's presented or, or, or any unease based on what you're reading? Or does it seem like what you would expect from something on this scale? Well, I think basically the medical profession has been burying their heads in the sand about this for some time, really, and it's been ignored and it's not been addressed properly. It's been the elephant in the room. And there has already been plenty of data that's come out that's been worrying in the various reporting systems. 
And for instance, if we look at some um, recent figures that were used by um, the government, by the JCVI, about children's vaccinations, they were claiming perhaps about two chances in a million of getting myocarditis. But that was, that was just on sort of random reporting. But in Hong Kong, they started collecting all the data from all of the teenagers that were being vaccinated, prospectively collecting the data on everyone and questioning them for weeks after. And they found 425 cases per million. So 200 times more when you actually look for it. If you don't look for it, you won't find it. And again, I would agree with Claire, really, that there are two things about the current data. There were lots of redactions in the current data where there's lots of bits just blanked out. And, of course, they've got eight months to produce this data. They didn't want to produce it at all for 75 years. And you have to ask, well, why would that be? Um, but the rate it's coming out, of course, the things that are going to really tell us what's gone on will be in the last couple of months, probably. I have to address that question again, really. You, you, you touched on it there, but why, why, having seen what's there now, was there any reason to be so protective of that mm. data? Well, I think or is, it, will that explanation come out in something that we haven't seen or may never see or that well, isn't there? It, even going back to the original Pfizer um, data from their original trial, Pfizer only ever claimed a modest reduction in severe symptoms. They never claimed it would stop you catching COVID or passing it on. That claim came from somewhere else. They never claimed it would reduce deaths or it would reduce hospitalizations because actually there weren't enough people in that study to show that. Mm -hmm. And of course the study was carried out on people that really didn't really need the vaccine. They were healthy people between 18 and sort of 70 they didn't have the elderly people that were at risk. They didn't have the people with comorbidities that were at risk. They were all excluded from the trial. So you were, you were trialling a drug on a population that really wasn't the population that needed it in the first place. Um, and I think it wasn't really the drug companies pushing for this vaccine to be used in such extensive groups of people. That was politicians because they saw they were getting a good payback with the public once they started their vaccination rollout. It was initially going to be 15 million jabs to freedom, if you remember. And I took my two doses of Pfizer, partly because I was told it was going to protect my patients, which I know now it doesn't. And I was told I was going to be one of those 15 million jabs to freedom. And I thought, well, let's take one for the team and finish this for everybody. Mm. And that was also untrue. Have we simply got a long way to go, Claire? Is this, is this something that's going to be drip-fed over a, a, you know, a long, drawn-out period? Um, it does feel like it. I mean, there are other things that are happening in parallel, of course. So you may have heard of Brooke Jackson, who was one of the people working on the Pfizer trial, but in a subcontracted company in the States. And she has whistleblowed about what went on in that site. And she's got a court case that's going on, and they've released documents as well, um, and so there may be more that comes out from her case that, that preempts some of the stuff from Pfizer.